All right, now it's time for some Johann Sebastian Bach factoids. Um, let's talk about what he composed. If you're looking at your paper, you'll see kind of like a little section at the top that marks out what they are. He composed for orchestra. He composed concertos. He composed chamber music. That's um, pieces of music for smaller groups of musicians. He composed keyboard music. He did not compose opera. We talked about that. He did not compose, obviously, for theater or film because that was not a thing. He did not compose ballet. He did not compose for a band because, believe it or not, that really wasn't a thing either. Um, he definitely composed choral music, so that was for voices. He didn't really compose vocal solos unless they were part of larger works in which the choir was taking part. Okay? Um, so here are some factoids for you. Um, he had 20 children, several of whom became composers. Keep in mind that only 10 of them survived to adulthood. So once again, a really sad thing that happened during his life. Although he wrote thousands of pieces of music, less than a dozen were published during his lifetime. Bach never composed an opera. He thought they were frivolous. That means like silly. Richard Wagner said Bach's music is the most stupendous miracle in all music. Now that might sound like he's insulting it, but he didn't say it was stupid. He said it was stupendous. That's good. Um, Bach enjoyed the music of Antonio Vivaldi. And hey, we already talked about him, the Red Priest, remember? Okay, um, here's what was going on during the lifetime of Bach. In 1685, he was born and so was George Friedrich Handel. We're gonna talk all about Handel coming up too. In 1704, the Boston Newsletter is published, and it was the first newspaper in America. In 1709, this is a big deal, um, the piano was invented by the Italian Bartolomeo Cristofori. Um, just because it was um, invented in 1709 doesn't mean that it caught on, and it certainly was not an instrument that uh, Bach wrote for, although his music is very regularly played on piano now. Um, D.G. Fahrenheit constructs the mercury thermometer with a temperature scale in 1714. Do you guys ever remember thermometers that have mercury in them? You probably don't. They're all digital now. I remember that we would take the thermometers and you would have to like shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, and then you'd like stick it under your arm or stick it under your tongue. But you could do all sorts of things to it to make it register hot, and we always would try to do that to get out of school. Those were the days. And now having mercury in a thermometer is actually really dangerous because if it's glass and you crack it, you know, mercury is really poisonous. Um, in 1718, Yale University um, moved to New Haven, Connecticut. In 1731, um, Benjamin Franklin introduces a subscription library in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. In 1743, um, there was the first settlement in South Dakota, so that's kind of that westward expansion of the United States at that time. And then 1750 was the death of Johann Sebastian Bach, and the minuet becomes Europe's um, fashionable dance. And you may have noticed that Bach's death date in seven, 1750 um, corresponds with the exact end of the Baroque period, and that is for a reason. Basically, historians have looked and said Bach is basically like the greatest, best embodiment of what Baroque music is, and when he died, Baroque kind of died with him for sure, okay? So we're going to move on and do the listen page, which you have. We're going to talk about the Toccata and Fugue in D minor, and you might be thinking, I've never heard any of this stuff. Oh yes, you have. You have definitely heard this particular piece of music and when you turn it on, you'll be like, oh, that's what it is. A toccata is a composition for keyboard instrument in a free style. A fugue, however, is a very structured work. It begins with a melody, sometimes called a subject or theme. This theme is then heard many more times while other melodies are played at the same time, always harmonizing with the original theme. In instrumental music, the original theme may be played by various instruments or in choral music by other voices. Bach defined a fugue as a conversation between two or more voices talking about the same subject in different ways, but in the end, always uniting in a final harmonious chord. The fugue was the basis of much of Bach's music. 
Bach was probably the greatest organist of his time. During Bach's life, the organ experienced a revolution in technology with improvements in the tonality and range of the instrument. Churches were building new organs or updating their old ones. Bach was not only a virtuoso organist, but an organ mechanic as well. He often traveled to other towns supervising the construction of an organ and then giving a concert. When Bach was a court organist to the Duke of Weimar, he wrote 39 glorious organ works, and one of them was the Toccata and Fugue in D minor. This is one of the few organ pieces where music historians have evidence of a performance by Bach himself in 1732. When you hear the Toccata and Fugue in D minor, you may think of Halloween and scary things. It is often used in movies and cartoons to depict monsters. Can you hear the arpeggios or separated chords as opposed to scale passages? I want you, and it says to raise your hand. You don't have to do that. But just think about when does the fugue start? There's silence right before it starts. And notice how you can hear the bass playing the melody. The organist plays the bass melody with his feet on the pedals of the organ. And so I'm going to ask for you, I'm not going to give you one of the guided listening things anymore just because I, I don't really like this one as well as I like the Vivaldi one, but I do want you to listen to it all the way through. It is a glorious piece of music. It really is. Um, and hopefully, I, I'm going to look this up and I'm not sure what I'll come up with, but I want to give you an example of an organist really using their feet a lot to play the bass notes. Um, the church I go to, which is in Grand Rapids, is a very traditional church, and we have probably the best and definitely largest organ in pretty much all of West Michigan, definitely all of Grand Rapids, and our organist is awesome, and we have, like, since we've been live streaming a lot lately, um, we have, like, the live stream will show him playing with his fingers on the various keyboards, but then we actually have, like, a cam that is right at his foot level so that when he's playing something fancy with his feet, you can watch his feet. So um, I may pop a video of my organist. His name is Dr. Larry Visser. He's fantastic. Um, and so that you can kind of hear and watch him do that, especially with his feet. Like, I've played the piano for most of my life, and I can do fine stuff with two hands, and I can use my one foot to do that one pedal, but I cannot imagine doing my hands on more than one keyboard, plus using both of my feet to actually play notes. Right now on the piano, when I use my feet, I only use it to, like, sustain the tones. If you play the piano, you know what I'm talking about, so... Anyway, I hope you enjoyed our study of J.S. Bach. Um, you just need to complete the review sheet. That is going to be based primarily on this, um, these last two segments of readings. Um, and then tomorrow, if all goes as planned, we are actually going to watch a short movie about the life of Bach. And it, I think it's really entertaining. But then again... We probably differ in what we think is entertaining. I do think you'll like it a lot. It's just, it's really fun, and it, it should only take one class period to complete. And um, it's more of like a movie with a plot. It's not just somebody explaining stuff over and over. So um, I hope you guys have a great day. Finish up that review. Turn it into Mr. Hill when you are finished, and have a great Wednesday.